Welcome to another lecture for Interactive Computer Graphics. Today's topic is going to be environment mapping. So this term can be used for sort of related but sort of a little bit different things. So let me explain what I mean when I say environment mapping. So let's say that this is our lovely canvas. I'm trying to render an image inside into this canvas. So this is what I'm going to display. This is what I'm seeing on my screen. Okay. And I'm rendering a scene. But let's say that I have a very simple scene. All right. My simple scene is just a teapot. Good. Now, I rendered it nicely. I shaded it with whatever material that I want. I have some lighting and everything is looking good, looking pretty good, right? So it's, it's pretty good. Um, it's a little sad though. This, this, this teapot is kind of lonely there, isn't it? It's, it's in this black void and it's just that one, one teapot. Um, not very lifelike, not very realistic at the very least. So it's, it's, it's sort of floating in space. So a, a lot of times it, it helps to give it some context, some environment to, to the scene. So let's, let's put this teapot in an environment, right? So, um, oh, there you go. It's in an environment. Now, I don't know if that's the environment you would pick for this teapot, it's just an example. I, I put it inside an environment. Whether or not it fits perfectly realistically, that's not my concern. My, my point here is that I put it inside an environment. It's not in a black void anymore, right? It's in an environment. And the, by, by environment, I don't mean that I just put an image to the background, which is, you know, yes, this is exactly what I did, but I would like that environment to sort of, I would like that image in the background to react to my, my camera position. So if I were to rotate my camera, I, I would like that background to rotate accordingly as well, right? So by doing so, uh, I am creating this illusion that this, this teapot is living in this, in this background. So if you're paying attention to this and trying to figure out whether or not this is really working, well, I, <laughs> I gotta admit that I'm totally faking here. This is, this is a complete fake. Uh, so don't, don't pay attention to it. I'll just stop the animation. All right. So <laughs> hopefully that, that, uh, that worked a little bit, but it was, it was totally fake. Anyhow, so you may think that right, this is simple. It's just one teapot. Yeah, I need something like this. I, I get it. But this is actually a very, very common problem. Uh, it's not a problem for just simple things. For a lot of scenes that we would like to render, we would like to put something in the background. Actually, imagine an outdoor scene, any kind of outdoor scene. Let's say, let's say Salt Lake City. Let's say that I model the entire Salt Lake City. All right, I have something going on in the Salt Lake City in this interactive application that's, you know, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, running around in the streets of Salt Lake City. I say I model the whole city. Am I going to model the mountains around it too? I mean, they will be visible from certain D points, right? <laughs> so am I going to model them too? All right, let's say that I'm modeling them. Well, I'm, I know that in my application, I will never go to any of the mountains, but they are in the background. They are going to be visible from a lot of angles. So they kind of need to be there. Um, let's say, that, okay, I'm, I, model the, I model the mountains. How about the sky? The, the clouds, am I going to do every, am I going to actually model everything? Probably not really necessary, right? So things that are far, far away that I will never go to. In this case, the, these buildings in the background, I will never go there. I'm interested in the teapot, but I would like something to appear in the background to make it look more natural, to, to give this scene an environment to live in, all right? So that's the, the problem that we're trying to solve. So the stuff in the background is going to be stuff that is far, far away that I will actually never get to go in, in my application. So let's see how we can, we can think about this. Now, my scene just contains a teapot. Let's say that there's also some ground plane. Why not? And I'm going to have my camera somewhere looking at it, right? So what I would like is that, that I would like to put this scene 
into some, some environment. So one way to do that would be just containing this whole scene inside a sphere. Like imagine a sphere that contains the whole scene, including the camera. So this is a sphere. And if I put a texture on the sphere, in, on the inside of the sphere, if I put a texture on the inside of the sphere, like this, it's going to give me the illusion that this scene is inside this environment, right? So that's what we're trying to do with environment mapping. That's the goal. Now, as I said, this environment, the stuff that appears in the background, is going to be far, far, far away. So far away that I will actually never go there. I, I'm seeing some buildings or whatever in the background and trees or whatever. But, but I will actually never go there. They're going to be so far away from where I am, from where my camera is. So you can think of this sphere. So the, the, the question is, of course, how big should this sphere be? And the answer is, its, it's radius should be about infinity. Ideally, that's what it should be, right? It should be at infinity. Um, because it's going to be so far that I, I will never get to go there. But can I do infinity? Well, at the very least, at the very least, it needs to be very big in comparison to my scene. Right? My, my scene, including my camera and everything, needs to be much smaller than the sphere that contains it, this environment that contains it. All right? Now, this is going to make things um, quite convenient, actually, just assuming that the sphere is at infinity. It's it's, it's radius is infinitely large. It's going to make things quite convenient because if I want to know the texture value at any point on the sphere, and I would like to know that when I'm looking at the sphere from a particular angle from the camera, I just need to know the direction towards that point. From, from any point, I just need to know the direction. And I don't necessarily need to know where a view vector like this originates. Let's, let's, let's say that this yellow one, I, it, I know it's not in the direction of the camera, but it's just some, some example. It's the, this yellow vector, let's say that it's a view vector and I would like to know what that vector sees on this background sphere. I don't need to know where exactly this vector originates because my scene is so small in comparison to the size of the sphere that I can assume that it always originates at the very center of the sphere. And that would be a fine assumption because the radius is infinity and the scene is, in comparison, infinitely small. So the scene is like a point at the center of the sphere. So it doesn't really matter, that means, from which point this particular vector originates, what I care about is only the direction itself. And from that direction, if I assume that it's starting at the very center of the sphere from this direction, I can find what point on the sphere that direction is looking at. So what I would like to do is that I would like to be able to sample the value of this texture of this environment texture at that point that corresponds to a direction. So when we're using environment mapping, we're going to be accessing the environment map using a direction only. And we're not going to do anything else. We're not going to sample it in any other way. We're just going to sample it using a direction because that direction alone is sufficient for us to figure out what we see at the environment. All good? All right, so how are we going to do this? What we need to do is that, well, obviously I have some texture map on a sphere here. So what I need to do is to get this direction and somehow convert it into a texture coordinates. So I'm going to get that direction and I'm going to convert that to a texture coordinate. Okay. Now, how I'm going to do this will depend on how this texture is mapped onto the sphere. 
obviously. Like whatever kind of mapping function I used, that's going to determine how I'm going to take a direction and convert it to a texture coordinate here, obviously. Now for that, there are various options that people use in graphics. Um, one way would be using these um, spherical or equirectangular or lat long or latitude longitude mapping. So in, the, in, the, in this mapping, you just look at the latitude and longitude and uh, figure out where that direction corresponds to in latitude and longitude, and then that, that, gives you, that gives you this map. So as you can see, things are sort of <laughs> bent a little bit, this, this, this spherical distortion on the texture image that we're seeing. And this texture image is generated with, with this sort of mapping. So when I take a direction that, and convert it to a texture coordinate using this function, I get the, the correct position on the texture, right? And because this texture is generated using that function, that works out fine. So I'm not giving you what that function is, but I'm telling you this is one way of doing this. It's not the only way of doing this. There's another way. Another example, another popular example is this light probe or angular format. So in this case, you may, if you have never seen something like this, you may think that, oh, like this is like a sphere. I'm just looking at a sphere. It is, it is very much like it. Actually, they, they generate a mapping like this, environment maps like this, by oftentimes taking a photo of a sphere, of a very reflective sphere. So if you put a reflective sphere and take a photo of it from one direction, you, you get an image like this and that would be your, your environment map. You may think that, oh, this is just going to reflect things that are, when I'm looking at it like this, it's just going to reflect things that are behind me. That's not quite the case though, because reflections around the perimeter here will actually be along the directions that are behind the sphere. So the, if you look at all of the directions here on the sphere, it actually contains everything in, in all directions. So you can see all directions on the sphere, except for the very thing that's right behind the sphere. So if I put my hand behind the sphere, you may not be able to see it. <laughs> but beyond that, except for that very point, it will see everything. It will also see <laughs> the person taking the photograph of the sphere, but they, uh, they sort of do some image editing afterwards and, and erase that person manually. Or they could use automated algorithms. But regardless, the, the, you, you could see the person with the camera uh, in these light probes. So this is generated by basically taking a photograph of a sphere and it gives you everything in all directions. So you can use this, you can do the angular conversion with the reflection function and figure out where any direction is on this sphere, right? There, there is a mapping to and from this direction to texture coordinate. So the, the problem here is that there is quite a bit of distortion here. Now, things that I'm seeing in, in the middle, right over around here, like right behind me when I'm taking a photo of it, they're okay. But the things that are behind the sphere, they're sort of distorted quite a bit, especially the points right around the sphere, right behind the sphere, will be around this perimeter, right? So like all of this all of these pixels, you can see that they're almost like the same color, right? Kind of hard to see, but you know, around the edges is almost like the same color because it's the stuff right behind the sphere. And so around these, these edges, these maps are distorted quite a bit. So I have a, a good density of information near the center and around the perimeter, things are distorted quite a bit. So it's not uh, an, an ideal mapping in that sense. But it's quite convenient because I can just take a photo of a sphere and I get it, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's very nice. But oftentimes we, we take some environment like this and convert it into a different format that is not as distorted. An example of that is going to be this vertical cross or, or this, this, this cubic mapping. So in this case, imagine that these are representing the six directions that correspond to the six faces of a cube like this. 
right? So imagine that I'm at the center of this cube and I'm taking photos in, in six directions up and down as well. And each photo will be a you know, square shaped photo and that, that will be one of those little squares forming this, this cross. So that's, a, that's another way of forming this. And if you, you know, put these little images onto this, this cube, that's what it looks like. So it's, it's, these are telling me what I see from each one of those directions, right? So this is a, a representation of this vertical cross. This actually is what we call a cube map, a cube map. Now, cube maps are very, very important because cube maps are actually supported by our graphics hardware. So of all the, the options that we could be using for environment mapping, probably this is the, the most convenient option because it is actually supported by our graphics hardware and the, the graphics API. So a cube map obviously is going to have six different faces, right? One face for each face of the cube. So I'm gonna have six different images. And we're going to put those six different images on six different faces of the cube, but we're going to put them in, in a particular way. So the, the orientation, like how you rotate them, how you flip them, how you flip these images is going to be important. So there is a convention. So OpenGL uses this sort of a coordinate frame to determine the, the faces of the cube map. So there's going to be six faces of the cube map and X, Y, and Z directions are defined this way and each face will, will have these, these coordinates exactly along these directions. So if you take a photo of something and if you wanna figure out how to generate these cube map images, this should be your reference. Now, one thing to pay attention here is that this is not a right-handed coordinate system. This is a left-handed coordinate system, right? So Z is not this way, it is that way, right? It's, that's that's what OpenGL uses for for cube maps. All right. So what we're going to do is basically we're going to generate we're going to generate a cube map to be able to use this this representation. Let's let's do that. Let's talk about how to generate a cube map. Now a, a regular texture map we could generate it like this, right? A regular texture map. I generated the texture. I said. Hey, I'm binding it as a 2D texture and here's the texture data. For a cube map, I'm going to bind it as a cube map. I'm going to bind it as a cube map and I'm going to say, here's the data for one face of this cube. So that's going to be the positive X face of this cube. I have six faces, right? So I'm going to have to specify the image for each one of these six faces separately. So those are going to be my my six faces, positive X, negative X, positive Y, negative Y, positive Z, negative Z, as you expect. And I'm going to specify each one of them separately and then I'm done. So what else? Can we do MIP mapping? Sure, why not? After I specify those values for the faces, I can just generate MIP maps. And when I generate MIP maps, when I generate MIP maps, there you go. I can, I can use MIP map filtering. I'm done. One more thing that is specific to, to cube mapping is that I can enable this global flag, that texture cube map seamless. So this does something, something interesting. Remember bilinear filtering? With bilinear filtering, even with MIP mapping, we're doing some sort of bilinear filtering at different MIP map levels. With bilinear filtering, I need to access four texels around a, a, the point that I'm trying to sample. Well, this is totally fine to do within any face, but if my direction is such that I am at one of the edges or, or the corners or very close to one of the edges, then the four texels near that position may be in two different faces. So if I'm along one of the edges, then the, the four texels, or two of them will be on, on one face, the other two will be on the other face. If you enable this flag, our GPU will automatically filter across these edges. So it will do bilinear filtering across the edges properly, 
by taking two samples from, from one face and two samples from the other face. Of course, this is not as cheap as sampling within a face, so there's going to be some cost associated with it. That's why we have this global flag. So if you want to keep things as fast as possible, you turn it off. But if you want to get nice quality and you don't want to see where these images come together, you need to enable this flag. Because if you don't enable this flag, when you look at your environment map, you will be able to see where the, the edges come together. This will also handle these, these corners properly. So if you don't do that, you will be able to see the edges and the corners. They, they will actually appear in the final rendered image because the bilinear filtering on, on either one of these faces will not going to give exactly the same result. So you, you're going to see what we call a seam. All right. So enable this flag. It's highly recommended. What else? Well, we just need to bind it, right? Bind it to a texture unit and use it. And we can do that. So let's say my active texture unit is zero. I say, just bind it as a cube map. This was my texture ID. So I bind it as a cube map, I'm done. Good enough? Simple enough? Yeah. Okay, well, if you want something even simpler, <laughs> we can use the, the CYGL header. <laughs> so in this header, I have this, uh, this, this class Texture cube map class, you just say initialize, that will basically create the texture ID. And then, you know, if there's a loop for loading the image from file, image for each face, and then say, up, oh, this is the image for face I. Okay. Um, and, and then you say, oh, build mip maps, and I want to use seamless textures. Done. And then whenever you want to bind it, you bind it to whatever texture unit you want. Now it's basically calling exactly these functions that I showed you earlier inside uh, inside these class methods. So if you want to use that, it just makes it a little bit easier to to use in my view. But of course, not as general as the OpenGL option. So what do we do in in GLSL though? So I I send this texture to my my shader. So here's an example of a fragment shader, very very simple fragment shader. In this fragment shader, I am sending my texture sampler as a sampler cube. All right, so this is this is what my texture is. I call it N, short for environment. So, and, and I'm going to be sampling it using the same function, the texture function that we have been using for sampling textures. So texture function, but the texture coordinate is not a 2D UV coordinate this, in this case. It's not a 2D UV coordinate. It is going to be a direction. So what this is going to do is it's going to take my direction and it's going to figure out which face of the cube map that particular direction corresponds to, and then it's going to sample that face. And if it needs to do mid mapping, it will do mid mapping. If it needs to do anisotropic filtering, it will do anisotropic filtering. It will do all of that stuff automatically. So for me, all I need to provide is just a direction, right? So this makes using cube maps for environment mapping really, really convenient, right? So you could, we could use other types of mappings, but cube mapping becomes really, really convenient because hardware already supports it. And also this is a very, very good way of representing these directions as well. It's an efficient and low distortion way of representing these directions. So it's, it's, it's good and a lot of ways and that that's why this is what is chosen for our hardware to implement all right so that that's what that's what it is simple enough you just give it a direction and you're done does the direction need to be normalized very good question no it does not need to be normalized you can it just cares about the direction it doesn't care about the, the magnitude of the direction of course it shouldn't be zero um, that, that might be a problem. If, it, if you give it zero, 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 that would be a zero vector. With, oh, basically, it has no direction. That could be a problem, but it doesn't have to be normalized, no. So it's perfectly okay to use unnormalized directions. One more question. So would you usually do this rendering pass in one program and then render the content? Very good question. You're talking about rendering the environment map. That's going to be our next topic. I want to render the environment map. How am I going to do that? I'm obviously, I'm going to render my object 
and I can need to figure out a way to render the background. Now, I can't just say, oh, here's the cube map, just put it in the background. Or I can't just say, oh, clear the background with this texture. You kind of need to figure out which directions on the texture to sample and whatnot. That, that requires some computation, right? So I'm going to need to run some sort of a fragment shader for each one of these background pixels. I, I'm going to write a probably very simple shader, fragment shader. So, and that, that will need to run for each one of these, these pixels here. And for that to happen, for that to happen, I, it's, it's not like I have a unused pixel fragment shader kind of thing. <laughs> so, I mean, the teapot is occupying only some pixels, right? For all these other black pixels in the background, somehow I need to do some, something so I get a fragment shader call. Now, what can we do? How can we do this? Well, let's start with something easy. Let's say that this is my, my camera and I would like to render this environment map. Let's forget about the, the, the scene and the teapot and everything. I just want to be able to render the environment map. Uh, so what the, the probably the simplest thing we can do, simplest thing we can, we can think of right away would be just rendering a sphere around, around our camera. More specifically, what I mean is that, oh, here's, here's my camera. And let's say that um, this point is my camera position. That's the, where my aperture is. That's my camera position. So I'm going to put a sphere centered around that point. All right, so this is my sphere. And inside the sphere, I have my, my texture map that's defined by all the directions. So my camera is looking at a particular direction and seeing a particular part of this, this sphere. And that's exactly uh, where I'm going to be seeing my background, right? So this is, this is definitely one way of doing it. I can just render a sphere around, around the camera. So in, in camera space, this sphere is going to be at the origin and it will have some radius. Hmm. What's the, what's the radius of the sphere? Uh, I kind of need to figure out what the radius is supposed to be, right? I, I, obviously, I can't make it too small because I definitely want this, this end over here to be beyond my near plane. There's going to be a near plane, right? And if it is closer to the camera than the near plane, then I'm not going to see it. It's not going to be in my view frost room. So it needs to be greater than the near plane. And of course, it also needs to be smaller than the far plane distance. So something in between the two should work. Uh, as long as it's in my view frost room, I'll, I'll be okay. But wait a second, I'm going to have other objects in this scene as well. I, I rendered this, this background environment very good, but uh, presumably I set up my view frost room here, well, my near plane and far plane, based on my scene. And in my scene, there's a teapot and it's, let's say, right in the middle of my view frost room here. Sorry, if I just render it like this, I'm going to be a little bit in trouble, right? So my background sphere will be occluding a part of my object, which is definitely not what I want. I want this to be in the background. So how can I, how can I avoid that? Well, all right, the simplest idea probably is this. I can just clear the screen, render my background, and clear the depth buffer, then render my, my objects. So over here, I'll be clearing my background. So, so what happened is that I cleared my screen and I rendered the, the background environment. So now all the colors of the pixels are having the background, background color, whatever that background image is. And then I cleared the depth buffer. Depth buffer is gone. So nothing in the background will be occluding anything now because I cleared the depth buffer. Now, when I render my object, it's going to be in front of the background. I, this, this is a solution that works, but I'm not liking this. I'm not liking this at all. I'm not liking this because this is rather expensive. 
I have this, this clear. So it's going to use a depth buffer and then it's going to clear that depth buffer again. And this is sort of unnecessary. I mean, it's not the most expensive thing you can do, obviously, but there's a cost to cleaning the depth buffer. So this is not great. Not great. Okay. I want to get rid of this. I want to, I want to do this without having to clear the depth buffer. How am I going to do that? Fairly easy, actually. I can just say, you know, when I'm rendering this background, I don't really need a depth buffer when I'm rendering the background, right? I don't, I don't care about the depth buffer. I just, I'm just rendering a sphere. It's, I, I, I don't need a depth buffer to render a sphere. So how about, and, and I definitely don't care about rendering the background to be corrupting my depth buffer. I don't need any depth data from my background. So how about I disable that? I say, you know what, GL depth mask, that means do not, GL depth mask, mask false means do not write anything to the depth buffer. So all these operations over here, that they're, they're not going to be modifying a depth buffer at all. And then I'm enabling the depth buffer writes back again. So I contain my background drawing between these two, disable depth buffer writing, and then enable depth buffer writing. So my background rendering is not going to be touching the, the, the depth buffer, and I'm done. All right? Good enough. So I can just uh, render it, render a sphere of whatever radius I like, as long as it's within the near and far planes. Good? Yeah, this is, this is a solution that works. Now, what I'm not liking here is a the sphere. So it's not like I have a sphere primitive on my, my GPUs, right? I can just say, oh, here's a sphere, just render it. A sphere is defined very easily. It's just a position for its center and its radius. But if I'm going to use rasterization for a sphere, I'm going to have to triangulate it. Uh, triangulate a sphere? I'm not liking that. There's going to be lots of triangles. Um, I mean, maybe not millions of triangles, but still, it's going to be unnecessarily many triangles. How about I do something simpler than a sphere? Does it have to be a sphere? It really doesn't have to be a sphere. How about we use a, a cube? I mean, we use the cube to, rent, to represent our texture using a cube map. So why not use the same type of, same type of structure for representing, for actually drawing the environment? Why not? We can do that. In fact, with a cube like this, I can just uh, put the texture map, one, accept the texture map on either side, but probably I don't want to do that. But anyhow, I, I have this cube and I can place this cube in the world coordinates in the world coordinates such that when I rotate my camera, what's going to happen is that in camera space, this cube is going to rotate, right? So it's sort of automatically figuring out where, where it's looking at. So based on the, the positions of this, this cube vertices, I can determine the direction from the center to that direction in world space, and I can use that direction for sampling the, my cube map texture. And this works perfectly fine. This is probably one of the easiest ways of rendering the environment. But it's not going to be the, the most efficient way of rendering the environment. We can do better than this. Now, as you can see, I probably don't need some of the faces of this cube. Right, so this cube has six faces. Each face will have two triangles. So I have, I'm working with 12 triangles. I probably don't need 12 triangles. Right, some of these triangles will be behind the camera, obviously. I may need more than one. I actually don't know how many I will need exactly. That depends on the camera angle. But some of them I definitely will not need. So how about, instead of doing this, just instead of doing this, 
What was my problem? My problem was that I needed a fragment shader to run for each pixel of, of my canvas. I just needed a fragment shader to run. How about I draw something like a, like a plane? Like a plane in front of this camera. Can I, can I do that? I can, I can do that. Actually, that's, that's fairly easy. So imagine, imagine this, this canvas that, that we're rendering. All right, so on this canvas, I can just draw two triangles like this and just put the texture map on that and I'm done. Now, how am I going to do this? Like, how am I going to figure out where to place these triangles so they will be exactly in front of my camera? Now, if you try to figure out exactly where you're supposed to put these triangles in world space such that they will be in front of your camera, that might be a little bit tricky. But if I specify the vertices of these triangles in the canonical view volume, that's going to be fairly easy. Because in, in what is called the clip space, uh, OpenGL calls it the clip space, that's the canonical view volume. In clip space, these vertices will be like, that one is going to be minus one, minus one, Z. Wait, what is Z? Uh, I don't care about the Z coordinates. What's important is the X and Y coordinates. Z is, can be whatever. I don't care. Right? Because I'm looking at in the, along the, the, the Z direction, right? So I, this bottom left corner is going to be minus one, minus one. This one is going to be one, minus one. That one is going to be minus one, one. And this one is going to be one, one. And then I'm putting them all in the same, same Z. In, in this direction, right? But it doesn't really matter what, what Z value I pick. What I need to do is to figure out what world space directions each one of these vertices will correspond to. I need to know the world space directions from the camera to those points that these clip space positions will correspond to. Now, if I drew, the alternative was drawing a cube around the camera. In that case, I, I could tell what the world space directions, world space directions would be for each vertex of a cube. Over here, I'm specifying them in the clip space. Because I'm specifying them in the clip space, I need to convert these clip space positions to world space directions and I'm going to use those directions for sampling my environment map right so what I need to do is that I need to transform them using the inverse of the view projection matrix but what do I mean by this I'm going to be using the inverse of the projection because I, I want to go from clip space to camera space remember the projection matrix brings you from the camera space to the canonical view volume or the, or the clip space. All right. I would like to do the opposite of that. I want to go from my clip space back to the camera space. So it's going to be the inverse of the projection. I also need the inverse of the view matrix. Remember the view matrix is a transformation from the world coordinates to the camera coordinates or the, or the view coordinates. So that's, that was my view matrix. So I need the inverse of that as well. So the matrix that transforms from the world space to all the way to the clip space, including the projection, I need the inverse of that matrix, okay? And any translation component, I don't care. The translation components, I really don't care because this is going to be, I only care about the direction. So all of the translations, I don't care. They don't have to be, I don't have to consider that for computing this matrix. Are we all clear? Any questions here? I think there's one question. One obvious question is, what is this? What is this Z value? I don't know. Zero? Why not? <laughs> Zero. Smack in the middle of my clip space. Good. Okay, I mean, that will work. Why not? 
I could do uh, one, minus one, sorry. Wait, minus one is over here? It's not over there? Huh, wasn't, is it, isn't this minus Z direction? And this is Z direction? Oh, turns out, not really. In OpenGL's clip space, uh, it uses a left-handed coordinate frame. So in the left-handed coordinate frame, this is Z direction. All right, so we define our canonical view volume by saying this is the Z direction because we were using the, the right-handed coordinate frame as our convention. But in clip space, OpenGL assumes it's going to be a left-handed coordinate frame. That means this is the Z direction. So minus one Z is over here in the depth buffer and plus one Z is going to be way, way over there. <laughs> okay, DirectX used to use left-handed coordinate frame for pretty much everything. So in DirectX, that, everything was convenient. In, in OpenGL, certain things are right-handed coordinate frame, certain things are left-handed coordinate frame. Actually, nowadays, it doesn't really matter too much what coordinate frame you use because all this matrix-related stuff in the graphics APIs are deprecated, so it doesn't really matter. But in clip space, OpenGL will say that that's going to be one, and this near plane is going to be minus one in Z, okay? Now, actually, this position is not okay. This might look ideal, but it isn't. It's not ideal because Z is equal to one will be just outside of our view frustrum. Z is equal to one will be just outside of it. So we need to bring it back just a little bit, just a tiny bit, just... there you go. Good enough. <laughs> just keep it inside, not one, smaller than one, all right? Just keep it inside. So this is, this is probably good enough. So we're, we're all good. All right, so what do we do? We're rendering. We're rendering the environment. So I'm clearing the screen disabling depth rights and then rendering the background and then I'm enabling the depth rights again so that I can draw my scene properly. So in this case, it doesn't really matter which Z value that I pick, right? Because for my canvas, I'm starting with clearing and then I'm drawing my, my environment as my background. And while drawing the environment, I disable the depth rights. So it doesn't really matter which depth value I use for drawing this, right? I'm going to get the same thing. Doesn't really matter. And then on, after I'm done, I am drawing my objects. Now, here's one thing that is not quite ideal. Here's one thing that's not quite ideal. Over here, looking at this, do you see that I computed some pixels twice? So all the pixels that are covered by my teapot, I had to compute them twice. I compute them once as background pixels. I computed their background values. And then I computed them again for the teapot. Now, remember, this is interactive computer graphics course. That means performance is very, very important. So I'm going to keep talking about these performance related things. So this may not seem like a big deal and it really isn't a big deal if you're just rendering a teapot but if you're trying to get a rendering system that's going to be using every little bit of your gpu power you kind of need to think about every little thing that you could save so this is wasted computation that i did not have to do but i did it because this is how i was rendering so it's a little unnecessary. It's not very expensive, but it is unnecessary, right? It would be much better if I only computed the background for the pixels that I was seeing the background, right? Actually, imagine that you, you zoomed in and you're only seeing the part of a teapot and the entire background is not visible at all. I mean, because <laughs> I'm just seeing the teapot now, I don't see the background. Do I still have to pay the cost of rendering them? I mean, it's, it's not that expensive. It's just a couple of triangles, yeah. 
But beyond these triangles, I am sampling my background uh, environment map. And that's going to have a cost. That's going to bring some data from the GPU memory. It's not free in any way. It's not free. It's not very expensive, but it's not free. So there's cost. And if it is unnecessary, I should get rid of it. How can I get rid of it? Well, the way to get rid of it would be reversing the order of this rendering. So if I were to render the teapot first, but that's my scene first, and then I try to draw the background after I draw the teapot, then my fragment shader for the background would only work for, would only run for pixels where the background will be visible. For all the pixels where my teapot is visible, my background is not going to be visible and my fragment shader for the environment map will not be called. All right, so if I want to do that, what do I do? I draw the teapot, and then maybe I draw this background far enough away that it's not going to interfere with my teapot. So in this case, it would make sense to draw my background way back here, right? All the way back so that it's not overlapping with my teapot. Because if I just put my background in the, at an arbitrary position in Z, then it's going to be overlapping with my teapot. But if I put it way at the back, hopefully if I set my view frost room well, well enough, it's not going to be interfering with anything that's supposed to be visible inside this view frost room. All right. A question here. Does it matter in terms of complexity if I use GL enable disable GL depth test instead of GL depth mask? Now, enabling disabling depth tests is different than enabling disabling depth writes. You might disable depth tests, but when you're rendering, you will still write to the depth buffer. Just disabling depth tests will disable the, the visibility test. All right, we'll disable which triangle should be in front. So the triangle you draw last will be drawn on the frame buffer, including the depth buffer. So you will still be writing to the depth buffer, which is not something that we want. Okay, so we're rendering like this. Very good. So what I'm doing is that here's my canvas. I'm just drawing two triangles and in my clip space, which is pretty good. Like it's much better than drawing a sphere and also better than drawing a cube. But instead of 12 triangles, I'm just drawing two triangles. Better, right? Right? And it's, it's great. It, we, can't possibly do anything better than this. This is as, as good as it gets, right? This is the best thing we can do. I mean, right? I, I can't possibly do this with a single triangle. Single triangle is a triangular shape. It doesn't have a rectangular shape like my canvas, right? Or can I? Maybe? <laughs> you're guessing no? You're, you're right. I mean, yeah, I'm drawing two triangles for this canvas, but what if, what if, what if I drew just a larger triangle? How about this one? So this triangle has coordinates, clip space coordinates, minus one, minus one Z, three minus one Z, and minus one, three Z. And it's going to be just passing through this corner in clip space. Would that work? Yeah, why not? And remember that all of our transformations that we've been using from going to and from the clip space, they are all linear transformations. So it's okay to pick points that are outside of this clip space. That's perfectly fine. The linear transform, like everything will transform linearly and you won't, you won't be in trouble for picking positions that are outside of the clip space. You just need to do the same thing. You just need to transform them using the same inverse view projection matrix 
and, and, and you're done. You basically do the same thing as you did with the two triangles, but instead of picking those two triangles, you just pick one triangle that looks like this and, and you're done. Of course, this is not the only triangle that does this. There are other triangles you can think of. Anything that is large enough where everything is contained would be uh, the, the whole uh, canvas is contained would be just fine. And, you know, fairly easy to pick a triangle in clip space, right? It's quite convenient. All right. So this is what I plan to talk about regarding environment mapping. So basically what we're talking about is putting a background image for our, for our renders. Or back, but it's not a static background image, but a background image that sort of reacts to the camera direction. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be adding a few more stuff next time. Next time we're going to be talking about reflections, and we're going to be talking about how to use the environment map with those reflections to render objects that are going to be shiny and they will look shiny and reflective. That's going to be our topic for next time. So we will be using that environment map or other things as well. Once again, thank you all for, for attending this lecture, and I am going to see you all next time. Thank you.